and welcome to another edition of Nurses Talk. I'm Lisa Tomka, and we are going to get real perspectives from real nurses. Real nurses like Carrie Balicki. Hey, Carrie. And another real nurse, Kevin Hook. Hey, Kevin. Our topic for today is clinical informatics. Healthcare is the last business sector in the United States to go with computers at the bedside. They're in Target. They're at the gas pump. When you swipe your credit card, that's the entire digital age. Nurses and physicians and others have been digging their heels in uh, for decades. When I talk with physicians and nurses and others in healthcare, not just physicians and nurses, I say, would you give up your cell phone? They look at me like I've got three heads. Cell phone, I say, that's exactly the same technology. Would you give it up? I, have, I was the last person to get a cell phone on the planet. Although I think you think you were. I really do think I <laughs> was. It was me. I was using a pay phone when I got paged to work when I was <laughs> manager. And I have to stop at a restaurant on my way into work to return a page <laughs> yeah. on a pay phone. I have the original Motorola cell phone. The big honking one? It's yes. like as big as that coffee cup? Absolutely. <laughs> so back to me. Um, <laughs> because it is all I about got, you, Kevin. I got a cell phone finally. And okay, I get used to that. I refused to get a BlackBerry. Well, all I'd ever seen was this. So I'm thinking a BlackBerry is for this. It's like a texting machine. So I, I, make the, I make the decision to leap to the BlackBerry so I can quit schlepping around my laptop to do email. Mm -hmm. And I call, I call the provide my service and I say, I need, you know, I need this, this BlackBerry. Oh, you're upgrading. And I said, well, if that's what you call it, then we are, I am. Then we'll transfer your number to the BlackBerry. And I said- Your phone number. Yeah, she says, we'll transfer your number. And I said, but I'll need a phone. There's something I'm not getting. So I call a friend of mine, and as I'm dialing her, I thought, I'll bet a BlackBerry is a phone. So um, the point of the story was, not only was it I'm embarrassing, but uh, what I took away from that is that if you don't know, it's that if you don't know what you don't know, then you don't ask the right question. And if the other person on, who's trying to help you and be of service in this information stuff doesn't know you don't know, they can't put it together mm -hmm. either. Absolutely. So this person Absolutely. couldn't figure out that I didn't know that. So we kept hands. So it was the question and answer back and forth, back and forth, back because and forth. Because the person on the other end of the phone was probably 12. Well, that's generational. Exactly. Well, every, in, in answer to your question about health care uh, information technology, is it, inf it going to be ultimately just generational? I mean, uh, like 30 years from now, this will be a moot point? I think we'll keep progressing. I th but I think it better be a lot sooner than 30 in 30 years that we figure this out. And I think we need to figure out a common technology for healthcare. I think I, that's oh, I part of the problem. More. Yeah, but it's not intuitive. You know, we're used to, when you're learning a new thing at the hospital or the clinic or wherever it is you're working, you know, we, it's, what we do at home is intuitive. It's double click, double click, right click or double click. Mm -hmm. You get into an information technology in the hospital and it's no, it's drop down menus here, it's select, hit the check mark. I mean, it's not the same format. And so it, this seems like a foreign thing. Absolutely. It's not like AOL, right? I know to double click when I want this. And I don't know that we understand this this well. I don't think we do as clinicians. And I don't know, perhaps, maybe it's a myth, that our patients and their families don't either. So to help us explain this better, we've invited someone who's very grounded in clinical informatics. His name is Roy Simpson. He's a nurse. He's been doing this, he'll tell us, uh, for more years than I I care to think about and probably more than he cares to think about, but he's an expert on this. And so we'd like to welcome Roy Simpson to Nurses Talk to explain clinical informatics to us. Uh, welcome to Nurses Talk, Roy. It's great to be here, Lisa. Always good to be with you. Thank you. So clinical informatics. That's yes. What makes you an expert? Wow, great question right <laughs> off the bat. Um, what makes an expert? Um, I think an expert tends to have um, knowledge that is unique that's contributory to the knowledge of the whole. But I think the thing that probably makes me an expert by most people's standards is I'm heavily published and I'm old. <laughs> well, what's your nursing background first, since we are the nurses who talk? Right. Ah, great question. I am a, originally a diploma nurse, um, having gone to school in the late 60s and 70s. Um, being the first male in nursing in Georgia was quite an interesting really? journey. For, ev for everyone, and our audience doesn't know this, this is often an argument we keep strictly within ourselves and we won't necessarily go there, but what's the difference between a diploma nurse and somebody else? A uh, diploma nurse was the historical, traditional, hospital-based educational program. Mm -hmm based very much upon an apprentice model. Mm -hmm. um, baccalaureate is university academic teaching centers. 
um, associate degree basically in technical schools, uh, community colleges, junior colleges. I think they're all called community now. Right. Well, so then obviously, given where you are in your career now, you obviously have been adding on to that educational preparation. Yeah, it has been a journey. I think it, most nurses in their educational growth is a journey. Mine took a circuitous route in that I went to pharmacy school, I went to liberal arts school, but I had always had, even in my diploma education, a slant towards technology. The first technology system I developed was a diabetic system call-in. You pressed one to talk to the nurse practitioner and two to talk to the physician. And what year was that? Uh, 1971. Really? Holy cow. 40 years ago you've been working on this. All right, you're an expert. So where are we in healthcare? I mean, it seems like we're not, like we're the last we're the last ones group to of people so to get on the bandwagon why is this about taking using so long? it. Right, right. Well, I, I think there are probably three basic reasons that it's taken so long. The first one is cost. Uh, let's not be naive that cost for technology is exponentially expensive, and then it goes down over time. The second thing in order for an organization, after they develop cost, is to look at what it is that they want an information systems to do. What do they expect the benefits to be gained from it? Mm -hmm. Because that will determine basically the architecture of the system. And then the third reason is we don't have standards in healthcare. When you go to the grocery store, there's a barcode on the back that gives you numbers. We don't have even barcoding for all of our medications right. established. We don't have barcoding. That for are the any, same. No They're way. not a, from hospital system to hospital system, from a community hospital to an academic medical center. But even within a hospital, and I think this has this uh, goes down the path for what this means to physicians, is that there's not just one system. Right. There are a bunch of there's a operating room system and then there's an admitting system right. and then oncology then system. a patient has to answer perhaps questions in a well, yeah, in the oncology system. Yeah. But, you know, where you're leading with this line, with yeah. this thinking is because the point of it would. Well, I guess we would all imagine the point is that we're going to provide better care. But does it? Well, and there is the, therein lay the question is the is the move to the technology going to help us? And if not, why not? And, to, and if it's not, what are we going to do about what do we do now? Because if it's not about good outcomes and that I, that I use the tech, you know, I don't want to be used by the technology. I want to use the technology well, and this to is, do provide better care. Right. And this is kind of where I think that um, technology is great for the healthcare side. I think that we're able to mine a lot of information, to look at trends in healthcare, to look at outcomes for patients. So I think for that end, it's perfect. I think for the patient side, and I can speak for myself, recently going through an emergency room, they had an electric medical record. They entered my information. The nurse came in, asked me the same questions on her piece of paper with the computer in the room. The physician came in and asked me the same questions. By the third time, I said, go to your computer, because I knew enough to know that it was there. But I think to our patients, it's not really helping with efficiency at this point. Well, I mean, it seems like standardization is the issue, because... If everybody's sort of doing their own, I mean, every hospital system, every clinic is sort of... What does that mean for go, patients? Well, they go to, right. you go to a vendor and you buy that software. And then this, comp this hospital has that software. And the two softwares don't talk to each other. So I don't see that the continuity of care, maybe internally to that organization, might be better. But if you don't go back to that hospital for the next procedure, you have the, to and those two systems don't talk again. to yep, each other, yep, you're yep. starting all over yep. well, again. And imagine the duplication of tests. And the cost that it's costing the consumer and the insurance you know providers. I, right? I do, I do. Well, one of the things we have to look at the purpose of standards is standards have brought about evidence based practice. Right. We have never practiced in healthcare based upon evidence. Well, that may be news well, to the. What does that mean for our patients, though? See, we're ta I don't want us to talk about like we're four nurses sitting here talking. It's important. But what if when my mother, also a nurse, I might add, but she's getting on in years, and she's become an a increased consumer of health care. My father went in for surgery. He had both knees replaced two years ago. Uh, I don't know that they use the tools all that well. And we're talking a lot about a behind-the-scenes piece, but how is this benefiting patients? How should this benefit patients when you talk about their disparate systems or their different systems? Or owning their medical record. Yeah, they owning even their medical record. 
to have the right. But see, I got to, but let me just jump in quickly. Okay. But when you say the patient managing their information, that makes, I have to say that makes me a little nervous because I don't know that, I'm afraid, I mean, I thought the whole theory or the whole theory behind being a, the professional is that I can help you interp- interpret some information. I'm a little afraid that patients have too much and then read something into that that isn't true. Then I have, to, as the clinician, have to dispel them of this piece of, like I'm thinking of, I wrote this to myself, Google chondriacs. I heard this term recently. Um, people Google, I, I think I that. have that's these pretty, symptoms, accurate, and they get yeah. all this information because no one's really monitoring websites very well. Is this a reliable website? Is that not? I so then the next thing you know, you have a patient coming in saying, I know I have this. Well, no, you don't. And the next thing you know, right. we're having a little tug of war much, about too that. too much information? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think yeah, somebody, right. we, have to, we do have to wrap our arms around how we help our patient manage. I mean, I want them Absolutely. to have information, but then yes. our job then will become to help them manage that. Do you know what I mean? Right? I agree, but I think that part of that is, is giving them informed consent on their tests, on their results, and making sure that they understand what's going on and that, you know, we're tr- trying to do care plans now survivor care plans in oncology. And the whole purpose around that is with technology to say that patients, once they get through their active treatment, there's still long-term side effects we have to watch for. Well, a patient's never going to remember in five years, in 10 years. So we're trying to create a collaborative relationship with patients that they can actually go in and type in their information into their medical record. So if they have a chest X-ray or a mammogram at a competing hospital system, We can acknowledge it, but it goes back to if you keep your patients informed and you keep honest with them what's going on, they're well, not no, going to be Googling. Well, 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 I think the other thing we have to look at is that we have to look at paternalism within the healthcare industry, and we have to move the model from paternalism oh, yeah. to self-responsibility. Co- so, more collaboration. So, so when we look or at partnering, to, I guess. to data, to information, to knowledge, to wisdom, to the continuum of the process, it's up to us as professionals to see that we prepare the consumer to have the knowledge to be able to have access to the knowledge, to be able to understand what it is they do have or do not have. Okay. Then well, what do you... I want to ask. Then what does the public, what's the public's responsibility for that? What should That's our audience my, do? Sorry, did I... No, that is my question. The same question, I'm thinking alike. Well, you know, we, we don't want to get into Republican versus Democrat, but we do need to look at constitutional law and responsibility of mm-hmm. self. It's core to the American way of life. Absolutely. And as a core competency of every individual in America, you have responsibility for your own health care. I don't care what your physician so says. I, say I don't care day. what your nurse says. You are the best manager of your health care. Well, then, 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 the, then the answer, or the question and the answer, I don't know, is that, te- that health information technology, or informatics, since we're a few generations removed, as you say, is, to, is, is, is really should be, should be helping our patients Man, co-manage, mm-hmm. partner with their clinical provider together. That would be that would be the ideal end result. Right. And, One and, of the and, and then when we look at Art Robert Wood Johnson's future of nursing and the scope of practice, we begin to see why the scope expansion or the scope longevity of nursing is not about script of authority. It's about how do we partner with our patients to help them manage their But they their have to have health. a part in this too. But they do. This is, we but do. the patient will never succeed if we have competing health care records. That's exactly my point from earlier. And my vision, and I, you know, I don't understand why we have not envelop, developed a jump drive for patients to carry in their pocket and when they go to the provider or show up in an ER or if they're snowbirds and go across the country, that their medical record is there and that all the computer systems talk to each other. Well, get, that uh, is us, cloud us, computing. That is utility access. That is where we're going. We let's are get not, there. Let's get there. And let's get there. And one of the ways we have to get there is to take the patient with us. The patient is core to the future of technology Trying to get healthcare. a word in edgewise. See, when you get a bunch of nurses talking. So, to, speaking about that, there's funding in this country currently that I don't know that our patients understand. And it's helping to put computers into the hands of physicians and nurses and others. And it's called, we, we call it the acronym, we call it ARA. Can you explain that a little bit? What is ARA and why is this such a big deal going on right now and why patients might be seeing 
these big transitions for clinicians to start getting the jump drive? Because there's, there's some requirements. You know, the feds don't just give out money without having you meet some, some requirements. Can you explain that a little bit? Um, I'm not sure that I can explain all of ARA as the, as the total law, but I think there's like some the components. Oh, level. there you go. Um, one of the things is meaningful use. What does ARA stand for? Um, it stands for the American Recovery Reinvestment Act. Right. And as the American Recovery Reinvestment Act, one of the major focus is on technology innovation. And that hospitals, in order to, as we talked about the cost, to move hospitals to the next platform of technology so we can get to cloud computing, is, is this funding for technological innovations in organizations. But in order for them to do it, they must meet certain criteria. Right. And the first criteria is computerized physician or computerized provider order they entry. They have to enter their own orders. But no more writing them down. And are nurses. we talking about hospital-based? Yeah. Or in, the cl or in, a, in, uh, in your private physicians? No, it's, move, it's, it's moving, moving to the It's moving clinic. It's moving everywhere. Yeah. Right. Uh, it will be right. by, 20, uh, by 2014, it will be provider offices, it'll be provider hospitals, it'll be, be uh, everywhere. Will you be dinged financially if you're not on board? Yes. Yes. Oh, well, then there's a financial incentive. There is, this is to, a huge financial incentive. This, That's what I want uh, our audience to understand, that if they begin to see this more, they'll, they'll see the, perhaps the tension or they'll feel it uh, where they go to the doctor's office there because people now are, they're almost, if they want funding, they're forced to do this. But why didn't the funding start with establishing some guidelines? It does. It does. There's, it, some there's guidelines around what you need to collect and what you need to provide and what you need and for outcomes. an electric. It's outcome and outcomes. based. Yep, it's absolutely outcome based. But it's not cohesive that we're having, you named off, I think, five different companies that are doing um, electronic medical records. Mm -hmm. I still don't understand how we as a country or a patients are going to be able to manage their health care when we've got different systems that don't speak to each Carrie, other. Carrie, I think it's a, it's a topic that we're not going to cover today. It's a huge discussion. I, want an I know you do. Well, I know you want to answer, but we're it, not going to cover it. But it goes this. back to your point earlier today. that we're still in this transition period, and eventually it will. We will it, I think we'll organically get there to a uniformity. I mean, it's, sort of, it's like the inevitable life cycle of a new technology. That's it true. Finally grad, it finally migrates to a standardized way of doing it. Because one of the wrong. things we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with data sets. When data sets are definable, you can't transfer a patient's name if everybody doesn't know how many characters are in the name. Right. So we have to get it all down. We don't know how many we characters we need. We don't have a set standard yet. We don't have a set standard for is incontinence versus delirium. Well, I want to move us. I, I have was, to move us along. Oh, okay. I have to move us along. I've heard, and you guys might have as well, heard criticisms by not just clinicians, but by uh, patients as well about safety of data. You know, they're hacking into, what was the guy in London? Uh, the, the, oh, they were, yeah, they were, ta yeah. They, they, they were able to get into people's How are they keep personal records. So explain, for, if you can, uh, what things are put in place when we, how do I answer that? And I don't know that I always can when someone says, well, how safe is my data, are my data? What, what happens if uh, we have a lightning strike? What happens, and things like this happen, because this is all electronic. How do we keep it safe? Well, there are numbers of uh, parallels that go along with keeping data safe. The first parallel is why are people so concerned about their health data going out? And it's because the big data, issue. it, it yeah. has big issues it for is. Um, your insurance costs, mm -hmm. your potential employment, your potential relationships, prejudice, what, prejudice on what kind of illness and you what, might have, every Absolutely. all kind of things. So one of the things that has taken place is there are now laws to protect certain things for people who have pre-existing conditions. So the problem is is the implementation of those laws. But we still have some laws on the right. book. You're talking about HIPAA, exactly. Health yes, Information Portability and Accountability Act for our public to know that those are the things that they have to always inform you of no matter where you go for health care. You're saying, can you sign? They ask you well, to sign. Well, anybody who's been to a doctor's right. office lately. Or a dentist's you office. Anyway, you sign anybody. that form. loved ones in the hospital and they say, we're sorry, we can't release that information to right. you. And that's the family why. becomes yep. irate. That's why. That's right. It's HIPAA. We call it HIPAA in the business, but it's not health HIPAA. information, not HIPPO. Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. So how safe are our data? And then the next part comes in into the security of the system.
There are components within the system, firewalls, other technological terms that collect and maintain the security within the system. The third comes back to personal responsibility. It goes the same way with your credit rating. You have to be vigilant about protecting your own data with yeah, passwords and even, passcodes. I don't think people can wrap their minds around that really yet. Around? I mean, we've, well, you, I mean, here in the news, people, you should look at your credit report once a year. Yeah. I mean, really, how many people do that? I do. So, well, I bet you do. Um, <laughs> that comes as no surprise. Um, <laughs> good, good, good. But I and bet do I, you? Yes, I do. Do you? I just did it once. Okay. Well, <laughs> see? So we're at 75, 50% unless you go on our side and it's but 75. I don't think patients realize that they have the ability to ask for their um, history. I don't feel like they think they can. Right. They don't so, in a paternalistic right. but they society. Do have, they do have the chance. And if they read in that history and physical, I never had diabetes. You see it happen all the time. Because the mistake. public may not realize that a lot of providers have a standard script that they dictate off of. And then they plug your information in. And that's how those errors happen. But if it's not caught, or here's an example that happens all the time. Patients will have some dysplasia of their cervix. And their primary care provider will call it cervical cancer. And so it becomes in the medical record that the patient had cervical sure. cancer. They never had cervical cancer. They had some precancerous cells that were taken care of. But that's the reason, but see, that goes back to, that's the reason that physicians and, and other providers are, af they're sort of afraid to give you that information oh, you know, yeah. too much because then I can correct. I mean, if you're out there reading it and you, you freak out, then, and I don't know that, and I'm your provider, then I, what, I mean, it gets, I had to happen but to it me. But it goes back I actually, to nursing. Your nurses have to empower you that you are in control of your health care. It goes back to the nurses that are involved. Yeah, but I don't, I'm not, even now I don't know sure what that means. I mean, does that mean that I, the minute I read that, some nurse has coached me and said, do you have any questions, pick up the phone? No, if, you, if that, you're looking at your medical record and it's incorrect, you go back to the physician's office and How say... How do I know it's not correct? Well, you know if I you just have diabetes had a test or not. It, but I just had a test for something and there's a diagnosis. Well, you How just got a Blackberry, that? so I understand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well. You just got a Blackberry. But, but it happened to no, but it happened to me. I had, had, had to have a series of CT scans for a, actually a paralyzed vocal cord a few years ago. Imagine and, that. I know. And uh, uh, anyway... Um, <laughs> You know, now you made me lose my train of thought. Um, Paralyzed so I, cord. Anyway, so I happened to be, I was a, you know, a nurse in the hospital at the time, and I had access because I was internal to the system, so I could just log on, which, by the way... You'll get fired for it. No, no. Yeah. That's so a no, no. I don't work there anymore. That's a HIPAA violation. Because uh, you can't no, even no. do that. No, you can't so even do anyway, that. So at any rate, I read it, and it said I had um, cancer, sinus, sinus cavity cancer, pre uh, frontal left, uh, you know, frontal. I practically fainted. But that caused me about, and then of course I immediately call, you oh know, God, my ENT toll. guy. Oh my Lord. But it took him three hours to get back to me. So I got three hours in a state of panic while I'm still at work. Because nobody checked his dictation against the transcript. You know, that's because they right. dictate their, their refindings and so forth and so on. But I mean, that's the kind of, that's what worries me about, that's what worries me. Well, it, it is, but it, we don't want to go down that path. No, but what I, what I, I want to know is we have a sense, in the end, compu um, clinicians have a certain way they think about computers. And I truly, we're the last to go. I mean, we're digging our heels in the entire way. What about, what do our patients think? So we went out, we had a nurse on the street, Kathy Lambert, and we sent her to a senior residence, a community center, to ask them what they think about using computers. They're large consumers of healthcare. These were uh, remarkable uh, senior citizens uh, in the community. And, we, and even one was a retired nurse. And we heard what they had to say. Doris, now do you have experience using a computer yourself? Yes, I do. I have a computer. I uh, do all my banking on the computer. I also, um, I'm on Facebook. And I... Um, talk to my grandchildren on Facebook. I also uh, see them. I have Skype on there, and I enjoy some games. So what is your impression of the electronic medical record and, and how healthcare has evolved toward using that? Well, I think it's just fantastic that uh, you can go from one doctor to the other. They can, uh, you know, send you to a specialist or something, and it just all they have to do is get on there and, and type it out, and it's all over to them already. You don't have to carry any papers or any x-rays or anything 
Did you find that the electronic me medical record was more legible? Oh, yes. I could read that very well. Sometimes the doctor's writing, I, I couldn't read it. I keep my medical history up to date on my computer. And many of my physicians uh, type into the computer when they're talking to me. And if I call on one of the nurses because I'm having a problem, oh, no problem. She can access that right away because it's in their computer system. Michelle, you are a senior citizen who has lived a lifetime as a nurse. Now that you are what we call in the business on the other side of the sheets, as a patient, how do you feel about ele the electronic medical record and computers in healthcare? Well, um, yesterday I just happened to be at the doctor's, and the doctor was using um, a computer to compute my visit. And actually, I felt that he had distanced himself from me. I, he had his back to me um, and was using the computer for most of my visit. And I felt that it was very impersonal. Weren't those some interesting conversations? Uh, what was interesting is that the one person who was the most resistant to the use of technology was not a uh, would be patient, but a clinician. Yes. So I'm wondering, and that seems to be a current refrain among clinicians. It's it distances me from the the clinical encounter. That's a great statement. In 19, uh, excuse me, in 1836, the London Times described the device as foreign and invasive to the care of patients, that its hue and its character would always be seen as foreign. And they were describing the stethoscope. Stop it. That's what you're going to say. And so when we start to begin to look at the, the, the lack of embracing of technological innovations, from the models of caring, we begin to forget that caring, even in the Watson model, has components of technological innovations. And so to be a true caregiver understands the use of the technology to aid in the caring of the patient. But in these interviews, uh, with the exception of the clinician who's retired, these were retired, are retired community members, they loved it. They thought it was awesome that physicians used it. They, were, they thought it was awesome that nurses, nurses used computers to take care of them. They were insightful. They were informed. They said, they can go right to my record. I can take it with me. And generally, we think, and I, I don't know if we need to interview more of them to get more, you know, do a little research and get out there in, the, in a little more nurse on the street action and find out that they are okay with this that this isn't such a bad thing after all, and that perhaps we're being the paternalistic world again, that our patients can't possibly understand that we need to use this innovation and it's going to be impersonal. Well, then I think that makes the argument that if our patients like it, if it's going to improve quality, then where's the, bur the, the burden lay? Exactly. With us. And, and then how do we make that trend? I mean, I, I've heard it said before, you have to make the right thing to do the easy thing to do. So is there going to be a way... Yeah. Is there some magic? There isn't. I'll, I'll answer my own question, but then I'll let you. <laughs> um, there's no, there is no magic bullet to help a clinician get a past this resistance as a culture or as an individual. I think one of the ways that we will begin to see is that we'll begin to see the design of information technology systems more user applicable to the, cl to the care, to the person receiving the care, so that the person receiving the care, the patient, is engaged with the technology. Right. So that it's not the nurse and the technology, but it's the patient and the technology. Yes. Then the nurse then utilizes the technology to help them in their care. So, in the end, before we thank Roy for joining us, where can the public go? How can, how can our audience get more informed about this so they can do those things? So they can say, I'm bringing my iPad in or my little, th my little jump drive with my record. And regardless, if I'm a snowbird and I'm going from the, the cold of the Midwest down to Miami for the winter and I have all my record, where can they go to learn more about that? There are a couple of places that you can go. Clearly, the Internet is one of the greatest places to gain us information. There are probably five sites that I would look at. One is the Institute of Medicine has a site um, which helps consumers understand. Um, the other is the American Medical Informatics Association, which has nurses and pharmacist and dentist and veterinary, all the disciplines mm -hmm. as in their organization. They have a great site to help consumers. They are much more aligned with professional 
education than consumer, but there are some consumer sites. Um, there are health consumer sites. Just type in the word health consumer information systems and it will give you a list that fit you and your environment a lot stronger. And probably, as I constantly remind people, AARP always has oh, great so reference helpful. ability. Yeah. They, they, you know what? And as an organization who represents this amazingly informed group of our citizens, they are pushing for this too. So given that, um, and that they're not going away, this is not a trend, right, Roy? That's Use of correct. computers in healthcare right. is not a trend. There's a career in nursing for this, isn't it? Can you talk a little bit about a nurse informaticist for, so our audience understands that this is actually a real job? Sure. Nursing informatics is a specialty, just like oncology, just like administration, just like gerontology, just like psychiatry. It is its own clinical specialty. It requires that you have a BS in nursing, a master's in that clinical specialty of nursing informatics, and or a PhD or a doctorate, a DNP. Most people fall backwards into informatics in that they were in a clinical role. Mm -hmm. They become very involved in some type of system engagement. And then they, if they've already got their master's as in an oncology clinical nurse specialist, then they may have to go get courses in order to be aligned with it. There is a certification from ANA that you can be certified. What's the ANA? The American Nurses right. Association. And you can recognize that nurse by their C on their uh, name tag. Um, they are very aligned with magnet hospitals, which are the number one hospitals in America. Um, and then you also have clinical informaticists who may be non-clinicians who go get master's degree in informatics and deal with other types of data sets like um, physician data, data Still mining. Nurses. They could be nurses, but they could also be non-nurses. Okay. They could have another science degree. Or you can be a physician, and now physicians have postdoctoral work in informatics themselves. You know what I think, that as, you know, as, I, as this, this mm -hmm. part of this conversation goes on, it just, it just highlights the fact that once you're a nurse, mm -hmm. You, there are so many avenues that so you can go traveling down. Do. And if you've Absolutely. got a technology bent, mm -hmm. you can, this is like, oh, I'm going to practice nursing, but in this way. And isn't that, uh, we could talk about this for a long time, and there is a great future for this. Um, we've had Roy share a lot of his time with us today. Thank you, Roy, for Thank spending you. time and your expertise and your wisdom with us on uh, Nurses Talk. And we would like to uh, thank the audience for joining us and for Carrie and Kevin for being here as always. And uh, tune in next time when we pick up another fun, important uh, healthcare topic and another career in nursing. Thanks for joining us.